I'm going to sit down now and just open this up for questions. I mean, I think that you you, you get a flavor for for what's happening. It's some it's some incredibly exciting times, and we have a long way to go um, to you know what, what what we're really striving to do is and, and you got a flavor from this from each of our speakers is to move this from being research to being part of the public our public health system to being integral to the care and management that you would receive if you're a cancer patient, if you have hepatitis, if, um, if there's a, a, somebody in the family that's born that has a, a rare disease. And so in this progression, it's slow, but, it's, but we're moving this along, and there are some, you know, clearly some good signs of success here. So I ask you to just please come up and use one of the two microphones, and, uh, and please don't be shy. And I'm just going to grab a seat, and, and I'll, I'll start the questions out when you guys come forward. So please, any question is a good question. you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I guess what I'd like to just, um, and, and, and Joe, maybe I'll direct this to you, but it could be directed to, to any one of you. So, so, you know, really what we're, again, this inside-out paradigm, we're moving to targeted therapies now. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, Mel, you did a great job of showing this. Clara, you, again, same thing. You know, Joe, on the cancer side of things, it's very complicated because there's many things that are going wrong. So there's a lot of these targeted therapies that are coming forward. So um, just tell us a little bit about this progression. In, CM, in, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, there was a hallmark moment back in the early 2000s. And, um, and, and tell us just kind of how that progression has gone since then and how it's affected your practice and what you do at the, at the cancer agency. Well, um, that disease, chronic myelogenous leukemia, is a good example of um, the kind of thing I was showing on one of my slides. And so, in the white blood cells that um, one needs to make every day, somewhere along the line in the patient, a mistake was made. And as the chromosomes were assembled, one end of chromosome 9 was mistakenly moved over onto chromosome 22. In that new position, the uh, decoding of the gene made a scrambled gene. It was half of one gene and half of the other. And it was no longer open to the proper regulation that the cell uses to regulate the function of that gene. And over time, that erroneously assembled gene was making a protein that disturbed the normal balance of metabolism in the cell and led to persistent proliferation of those cells. Scientists found the place where the chromosomes were stitched together, realized that this led to the making of a, a scrambled gene product, a scrambled protein, and investigated the actual structure of that particular protein and were able then to make a chemical that could sit in the active pocket, the, the part of this chemical which was acting as an enzyme, and block its activity. The cells had become dependent upon that protein for their own continued survival, and once that was blocked, these cells died. So here, the technique of understanding the way in which the genes had been stitched together and made that unexpected and abnormal protein led to the discovery of a way to treat it and remarkably change the management of this disease. Prior to that time, Patients typically had to be managed with what's called a bone marrow transplant. That is, they were given very high doses of chemicals to kill off their own blood-making cells. They were given blood-making cells from someone else and grew a new set in their body, ones that didn't have any longer that genetic in, uh, misinformation. This is a dangerous, technically challenging, and expensive technique of treatment and um, was only partially successful. This new medicine, its name is imatinib, that blocks the activity of that particular fusion protein or scrambled protein. It was 
capable of transforming the disease so that very few patients today wind up needing a bone marrow transplant and most are managed by having this medication delivered to them chronically. And the end of the story is that some of those patients still get into trouble and further genomic analysis has been necessary to determine that in a few of these patients the fusion protein that's made has a different structure and the blocking molecule won't fit into the lock and key apparatus, lock in activity, and that has led to the development of subsequent additional medications that can accomplish that job when the original one couldn't. And so the story goes on and the understanding of the disease gets deeper and deeper and the number of variety of treatments that can be used become more and more effective. So, so Joe, just uh, this came in, we're uh, getting a, a, a Twitter feed here. And the question came in on, uh, how did, so how does it change the standard of care? So in that example, just with the, the, the Gleevec example, the CML example, so, so how has it changed the standard of care? Well, everything about the disease is now different. Um, whereas in the past, with only a partially effective, very expensive, potentially very toxic treatment, we wound up losing patients, and when we were able to do something effective about the disease, they had to undergo these very expensive techniques for their treatment. Now patients simply continue on a renewed supply of the medication that's blocking the abnormality from having any effect on their cells and can be treated with this for long enough time that at least some of them, the ones that are somewhat more lucky among them, finally the clone of cells that makes the, the, what has that abnormal genetic structure to it dies off and they don't even need the medicine any longer, they're actually cured but that in chronic medication that they've taken for a few years rather than the very expensive and potentially very dangerous bone marrow transplant technique. Thank you. A question over here. Anybody? A question um, likely for Dr. Connor as well, and that is uh, this technique of boosting the immune system to target cancer cells of a certain kind. Um, you're permanently changing somebody's immune system. So I'm wondering what other consequences are to that? Can it cause difficulties? Can it, can it interfere with other mechanisms in the body unintentionally and potentially cause cancer as well? Well, your question's on to a very important aspect of the immune system. So I told you that we're made up of 70 trillion cells, and all of those cells are, if you like, being constantly inspected by the immune system and when the immune system decides this is a proper, normal cell I'm supposed to be made of, and then it's ignored beyond that point in time. If we step in and take away one of the ways in which immune cells communicate with each other, such that we essentially allow that immune cell to recognize a normal cell, in this case a normal cell that has become cancerous, then we are employing the immune system to attack the now cancerous cell and eliminate it. But we've also taken away one of the regulations that keeps our immune system from attacking our entirely normal cells. And so a side effect of the kind of medication I was describing for you can be the development of what's called autoimmune disease. And so the brakes have been taken off the immune system and it mistakenly starts to attack normal cells in addition to the cancer cells. This is an interplay that we're only beginning to understand now. We're dissecting it with the techniques that we use, the genomic techniques, to understand the basic structure of the communicatory molecules that are regulating it. But it's the beginning of a period of time when we learn even better and better how to employ the immune system for tasks we want at the same time as being careful not to allow it to run wild and start causing disease as an aberration of that treatment. Yes, sir. With the more genomic data that's produced, is there, does the province have a plan to store all the data and share the data? And, you know, does it go beyond the province to the country? That's probably a question for you, Brad. <laughs> Well, it's, it, it, it's a very good question. So, and you know, and, and I think that um, so so the answer is it's being done in a uh, uh, the BC Cancer Agency is doing this very effectively for cancer patients where this is being done as a in a research or, or a clinical capacity, uh, and 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 the the uh, BC Center for Disease Control has these cohorts. Clearly, a 
consolidated data plan is something that's under discussion right now, and, and it's necessary. And, uh, it, and, and this is a, it's a, it's an extremely insightful question, because, I mean, if you can harness this data, and you can have two purposes that the data can be used for, uh, if it can be de-identified, then other people can look at that data, and it can actually be used for, for research purposes across the province. And obviously people you know, need to have, uh, again, this is why we're having a session like this and making you aware of some of these issues because ultimately it's you, the, 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 the people of the province of BC, the British Columbians, that need to be comfortable with that. So policies would need to be put in place to make that de-identification uh, something that would work for you. And, um, and so all these things are being looked at and, uh, and, you know, and they're being looked in other provinces <clears throat> you might be aware that the UK has embarked on a program called the 100,000 Genomes Project or Genome England. Um, and you know, we're actually working with the folks at Genome England and learning from what they're doing. And they're dealing with this uh, head on also. So this is something that nobody has a master plan for, but I can assure you that we're working with the best in the world and trying to come up with a good solution here. I might add that there's uh an obvious value in this information being made available to other scientists. And so, um, with each of the cases that we analyze in the projects that I've been associated with at the Cancer Agency, one of the techniques we use is to remove all identifying information. We unattach it from who this person is that this information came from. And we deposit that information in an, an electronic, a computerized, repository that is then available to other scientists. Now, this has to be done in, with some care, and we also build in the additional protections that it's only available to other scientists who themselves pledge to use this for proper scientific investigation and to protect the identity of the people from whom it was derived. But this allows us to put the information in a repository that an investigator in Germany or England or the United States can look at that, mine that information for new insights, and gradually we're building an increasingly diverse and populated repository for that kind of research. Clara, can I, can, can I just ask you to, to comment also, what I'd like you to comment on, is when you make this diagnosis in a young child, you're also making a diagnosis that affects the entire family. So can you just kind of comment on that? I mean, it's part of this database that this database so for this one individual now has ramifications for any, any relative. No, absolutely. And um, I, I think um, I also wanted to add to the previous conversation on sharing the data. I think for rare disease research, without sharing the data, we would be nowhere because we are constantly comparing the patient's DNA to what is the normal DNA. So that is DNA of sometimes up to 70, 75,000 individuals, which has been made publicly available. But also when we find a new disease gene, um, before we can actually prove that this, is, this gene is causing this disease, we have to find at least two, three other families with mutations in other places of the same gene who have the same uh, phenotypic or symptom findings before people start believing, okay, this might be a causal relationship. And so we deal daily with our collaborators around the world who have put the uh, symptoms into a database and have also made the DNA available if the families consent. And we are constantly comparing DNA. So I think it's indeed a very good question and has its, um, I think, ethics challenges still because DNA is, of course, a very, the most confidential information <coughs> that one can imagine. So I think there's a lot to be done still. But, and to come back to the ramifications for the family, this is um, um, of great importance. I mean, just today I, I spoke with three families who all had the same question for me, and that is, okay, how can we now find out if our daughter or son who may not be affected is at risk of passing on this gene to his or her children or marrying someone who carries the same disease gene and all of a sudden this disease reoccurs. 
And so what we do always is to uh, refer the patients to our provincial medical genetics program where appropriate counseling can be provided, sometimes for the very, uh, let's say, extended family who lives in other places in the world um, who also has a right and wants to know. Um, and I think it's, it's an important aspect and every individual and every family can be very different in, in how they choose to want to know or not want to know. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm a lay person and my question pertains to a front page story about a week ago in the Vancouver Sun that I'm sure many of you have seen of a woman in the Vancouver area that had five months to live and her oncologist gave her as an experiment, I believe, a trial, clinical trial, uh, a blood pressure pill. And now she has become well and it's running and, and back to normal. I would be very interested in hearing was that derived from this research? Uh, where do you see that particular use of a blood pressure pill in the future? Thank you. So this is a, a fascinating and exciting story that's unfolding right now. Uh, what's being referred to is a patient who was enrolled in the personalized oncogenomics program being run at the Cancer Agency in part with support from the BC Cancer Foundation and from Genome BC. So the, the short story, and it's a complicated one, is that this woman had a cancer that had come back despite the best of standard treatment. And the cancer cells biopsied from her body were then analyzed to investigate what was different about them, what had gone wrong, what kinds of genetic errors had built up. And by cataloging them and looking at the way in which the abnormalities interacted with each other, it emerged that there was one key pathway, a uh, way in which processes within the cell were cascading one to another, that looked as though it might be possible to block it entirely with the use of a medication that in fact is usually used for some different purpose, the, the, the purpose of controlling high blood pressure. So in this particular case, because she had a unique pathway that isn't present, as far as we know, in very many other people's cancer cells at all, but her cancer cells were dependent on that process, we were able to repurpose a medication. And so instead of using it to control her blood pressure, we, were giving, we gave the medicine to her to block that particular pathway. Those cells, deprived of that pathway to keep them alive, then died, and her tumor shrank uh, tremendously. What the future holds for her we don't fully know. We know for the moment that her cancer has been brought under excellent control and her health has been restored, but the cancer's not gone and there probably are some cells still in her body that um, have further evolved, undergone additional genetic changes and are no longer dependent on that pathway. And the risk is there that these cells will emerge over time. So she's in a carefully monitored program to check to see if her cancer returns. Now that pathway that was exploited is, as best we can tell so far, nearly unique. It's, if you like, very similar to the rare diseases that you were hearing about. Her cancer cells had developed a rare addiction to a particular pathway that most cancer cells don't. And so it was possible, in this case, to repurpose the medication uh, that's usually used for a different purpose and to treat her. That same high blood pressure medication really won't have any effect on other people's cancers because their cancers are not addicted to that particular pathway. What we hope is that um, this is, can be very similar to the story that you heard about children with rare genetic disease, diseases. Over time, we hope to be able to discover other patients that have cancer cells with rare genetically aberrant pathways and find medications we never would have expected to be able to use will be helpful for them. And build this into a program that shows the power of exploiting the capacity
to profile the entire genomic picture in the malignant cells. Thank you, Joe. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is both a general and a specific question, probably directed to Dr. Von Karmbeek, primarily, but, so here we are, we're sold on genomics, it's a great thing. How accessible, actually, is it to people in BC? <clears throat> and specifically, my question, um, concerns of pediatric application, say, very common now, and very specific also. Uh, a child presenting symptoms, social behavioral symptoms, a bit odd, could be Asperger's, could be something on that spectrum, uh, motor stereotypies, that kind of thing, and people are puzzled. The family is puzzled, the doctors are puzzled. Can we turn to genomics? I mean, how, how, how accessible is that to us? This very specific question. Excellent question. Um, so I think you bring about a very good point in terms of um, there's huge diversity, of course, in behavioral and, and developmental problems that we that we see, um, and in general, those um, developmental disabilities that are caused by single gene mutations or mutations in a single gene. Are, have quite a specific and severe display of symptoms. And it's not just uh, somewhat aberrant social behaviors with some repetitive uh, interests or movements. And with that, I mean to say that we're not there yet where we could say a child with high functioning autism, we can do genomics and find the genetic cause just because we don't know those causes yet. We, uh, there might be some out there which affect a single gene much more likely if it's in uh, multiple gene variants or many, many genes uh, against an environmental, um, let's say, background. So there is lots to be discovered before I think we can apply genomics in a meaningful way, and that is to give an answer and say, this is the cause. So at this point, um, and this is BC children specific, but I, what I'm reading also other places in Canada and around the world, um, exome or genome sequencing is only just becoming available as a clinical diagnostic test. That's, for example, the chromosome studies were. So that's only beginning. And we have recently, with the uh, Canadian College of Medical Genetics, come together with a working group and decided that for now um, the indications for such testing um, are quite specific and the patients should have um, uh, clear symptoms which, we, uh, which have been shown in the literature by other studies and centers to be due to a single gene cause. I hope, I hope that answers your, your question. And I see, I have to acknowledge the limitations in those kind of guidelines um, because that means that people are, are left out for now and I hope that's going to change the more we discover, the more we know. It's a very large group that's being left out and it's increasing daily, it seems. I'm just going to finish now. And it's very critical because these young children grow very, very fast. And, you know, obviously the time to catch something, as we saw in that video, is when someone is young. There's a critical time at which to catch it. Just a quick back. So it is very important to remember that many medical conditions, many illnesses, are not the result of a single genetic abnormality. That they are the result of the interaction of a very large complex of the processes that go on within the individual cells. And those are not going to yield to simple answers where we find one gene or one pathway that's wrong, or like the cancer patient I was just describing, one simple medicine fixes the whole problem. So uh, dissecting that complexity is a major challenge for us, but I think it would be an illusion to think that every child with a social or developmental problem is going to wind up having a single genetic cause that can be easily remedied. Is an oversimplification of it. We need to find out which ones are single causes and which ones have these complex causes. And it's going to be years of investigation to puzzle that out. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's just that it's a big problem, whether it's a simple cause or a complex cause. doesn't mean 
you know, it doesn't matter to the families involved. What matters is the direct Sorry. So, so, so just one, one point to, to maybe close this question out. I mean, I think, you know, so partly what we're living through right now is that we see, you know, these advances, the, the cancer patient that was on the front of the pa paper just a couple weeks ago. We see these amazing examples of success. But what we have to realize, it's a long road to actually getting this into clinical practice. And that last box that I had on my slide where I talked about establishing the utility, it's exactly what we're talking about here. It's establishing really a, a, a protocol that would allow a family that has a, a, a child with, a, with that's developmentally delayed, whatever the problem is, to actually know if that child is amenable to, 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 to this type of an intervention and what the likelihood of success would be with that. And I think since we have a, a, a public health system, really it's incumbent on us to work in the research community to actually figure that out, but do it with the rest of the world. I mean, we're not in isolation here in DC, so we're working with the groups around the world to actually, as Clara talked about, and, and Joe, Mella, all of them, I mean, this is a worldwide effort, but, but it's the technology that's driving this new way to look at things. And I think we're going to just see rapid advances. So. Okay. Thank you. Maybe just one one more comment. I can't help myself. So um, because I, I so much agree with your point that these children who show developmental disabilities should be looked at as early as possible, and I just want to emphasize that um, there are other tests to be done, more than the chemical screenings, which are much cheaper than the genomic screening, which we are promoting to do in, in these very young children with a program called TIDE, where we hope to actually get answers about how often do these kind of diseases, these metabolic rare diseases, occur in children who have these symptoms which are actually quite unspecific and, and uh, would not sort of um, have genomics as the first test because it's too expensive to do. And I'm hoping that by combining different testing strategies, which are not all genomics, that we can really figure out which tests to do in which child and try to leave no one behind. But where we currently are is, I think, still very much beginning stages where we're not able to help the majority, just a small minority. Okay, but you're saying biochemical testing is more readily available, is that what you It is more readily available, yeah, yeah. And so we're working with Child Health BC to, uh, and, um, to let's say, educate and work with the community pediatricians um, that they can actually order a set of biochemical screening tests which uh, is able to diagnose or identify about 90 or 100 of these rare diseases which can cause developmental disabilities. So they order the test, the child can go locally to a laboratory um, far away in Prince George or very remote areas, and all these uh, blood and urine samples come to our laboratory, and if there's an abnormality, we contact the community pediatrician, and then the child comes to us. So that we're trying that each child at least has that more basic screening for these treatable conditions. So, so now I'm going to ask you a question from Twitter, and then I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, to turn it to uh, the, the gentleman on the right. So, so two-part question. So, um, so these drugs that have just been approved are are are, are unbelievable in terms of their success, and they don't make the patients sick and so on. Why don't we just give them to all patients with hepatitis C? And second of all, if you did that, would it lead to more resistance, viral resistance, in the population? <coughs> Well, I'll answer the second question first. So, uh, we've learned a lot from HIV, which is the notion that if you want to prevent resistance from taking these antivirals, that you need to combine drugs so that you <coughs> are able to uh, effectively suppress the virus and prevent resistance from occurring. And the other thing that we learned from that differs from HIV is that hepatitis C, because it's so curable, eight to 12 weeks, there's no integration of the virus into the person, uh, into the host cells, then resistance is not likely to be an issue. 
So then, to the first question, um, these drugs are costly, and um, they are new. Uh, we have to make sure that they are indeed safe. We believe that they're safe. And um, there are things called opportunity costs, which are if you spend a billion dollars treating everyone with hepatitis C, will you have the money to invest it into genomics? And so it's really a, a challenge for us as a society, which is to really try to develop the information infrastructure that gives us good guidance about where to properly invest our health dollars. And that's one of the reasons that we've tried to create this hepatitis testers cohort, because it will give us insights about where we should best spend our money, and another challenge, for example, in the context of hepatitis C, is there are ongoing infections in people who inject drugs. And you can use this expensive antiviral, but you can get reinfected. So if you're going to uh, try and prevent uh, forward transmission in people who are actively in injecting drugs, you need to make sure that the person, not only do you cure them, but you prevent them from being reinfected by supporting them. So, it would be ideal to put it into the water supply, but I think we need to think about it. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. Yes, sir. So, this will be the last question, and I'll just kind of wrap things up. Yes, sir. Thank you. A question related to one of the previous speakers. Um, can genomics tell us something about the incidence of recurrence of cancers? Uh, take, for example, someone who has had breast cancer, who was cured successfully, is fine for a number of years. <laughs> Is there anything we know about what the likelihood of reincidence is? I mean, that's too general a question, not only for that specific type of cancer, but for other types of cancer that might occur. So there's really two parts to your question. I'll try to tackle both of them. Um, so the first challenge is a patient who has a cancer, and we have partially effective treatments, treatments that may make the patient very much better, may get rid of um, most or nearly all of the cancer, but some was left behind, often because the few cells left behind have already evolved to the point where they have resistance to the treatment that was just given. In that situation, there's a real premium on discovering that that person still harbors the cancer, and um, as it comes back, finding it when there's still a very small amount in the person's body. So a, a really exciting new set of techniques that is just now being thoroughly investigated is to profile the original cancer, identify the unique genetic characteristics, often specific mutations that are signals of that cancer cell, those cancer cells being present, and take advantage of the fact that all cells leak a little bit of DNA into the blood. So your normal cells and your cancer cells are leaking a little bit of pieces of DNA into the blood. And so we are now investigating sampling the blood and searching for pieces of DNA with those unique mutations. If it's present, then that's evidence that the person still harbors some of those cancer cells, even if we can't find them by any other diagnostic technique. And by monitoring that patient and watching the amount of such leaked DNA, we can actually potentially discover cancer is coming back at a much earlier point than we might otherwise have with x-rays or scans or from symptoms. That'll pose the possibility of stepping in with another round of treatment at a time when there's very little cancer present and possibly eradicating it or again suppressing it. The other part of your question was if you get one cancer, uh, what about other cancers? Um, that's a challenging area uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, we're probably not all equally susceptible to getting cancer. Uh, our genomic constitutions vary tremendously and it's undoubtedly there are uh, genotypic characteristics that are shared by some patients who seem actually to be more resistant to the development of cancer and others, situations where there's an uh, increased tendency or risk that cancer would develop. 
Now it's discovered some extreme cases of this. Uh, typically they're what are called uh, chromosomal breakage syndromes, where people uh, have a the inborn problem with the way in which they reproduce their chromosomes, and they're constantly introducing new breaks and problems in them. And those specific syndromes are well described, and we know to monitor those patients very carefully for certain kinds of cancer because their likelihood of developing them is markedly increased. Over time, I think we'll get better at understanding the differences between individuals and what it is that's protecting some of us and leaving others of us more susceptible. But that's, the big, that's a science that's just beginning now. And then finally, to, to end things here, the, treat, the very treatments that we use for cancer treatment are themselves cell-damaging and sometimes damage the genetic material of the normal cells. And so curing one cancer winds up putting the patient at risk of developing another cancer, perhaps some number of years later. The genomic techniques that we can use today are helping us to separate which treatments pose those risks. We can learn to minimize them. We can learn that some individuals might be more susceptible to those individual damages than others. And so we can start to integrate that information and choose between treatments so as to minimize the likelihood that we'll put a person at increased risk. This is going to take years or decades to fully unravel, but that's the kind of thinking that scientists are putting into it today. Thank you. So